Hey everybody, what's up? It is Mr. Extraordin back with another video. I'm not alone as usual. I'm with Rob Sibeko and this is African Frame. Um, we are still continuing with our Quentin Tarantino uh, movie series. And uh, this time we want to talk about Kill Bill. I believe Kill Bill is the... Which one Second? is it? Second. I no, believe so, yeah. No, uh, oh it's... yeah, oh yeah. It is the second that we're doing, but I just meant out of Tarantino films. Like, which uh, one maybe is... his third one. I think Jackie Brown is second. I'm not sure because obviously Reservoir Dogs is no Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. Then I think it's Jackie Brown, and then it's Kill Bill, I believe. Mm, so yeah, you're right. It's not. I think you mm -hmm. forgot pop. You pop. If you forgot Pulp Fiction. Yeah, I said Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Damn it. Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, um, Jackie Brown, and then Kill Bill, I believe. It's either really? that or Jackie Brown is after. I can't, I can't remember when Jackie Brown is. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure either. But, yeah, anyway. So mm, the film yeah. was released in 2003. Um, it stars Uma Thurman as the bride. I don't think in the first one we actually know her name. I know she's Bidrick's kiddo, but I think we found out the name in the second in yeah. volume two. We have Lucy Liu as Oren Ishii. We have Vivica A. Fox. We have Michael Madsen. We have Daryl Hannah. We have David Carradine, which we don't even see in this one. Yes. We just see his hands and we hear his voice, um, but we don't see his face, basically. Then we have Sony Chiba. Sony Chiba is an icon, especially in Japanese film. He has played um, samurai warriors and yeah, yeah. Like of that nature. Then you have Julie Dreyfus or something. I don't know. I'm butchering the surname, but I think she's the one who plays. Uh, what's her name again? Um, oh man, I love this lady so much. Uh, the the shotgun one, one or the or the um, the axe or the mace one? Isn't she the one who gets her hand chopped off? Yes, a mace. Okay, then the mace one, yeah. Um, I just mm -hmm. forgot. Sophie, Sophie something. Sophie Fatal or something like that. Oh, I know you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. And then uh, you have uh, Chiaki Kuriyama. I believe that's Gogo. Could be wrong. Oh, okay. Yes. And then you have God, so Gordon Lou. Mm -hmm. Gordon Lou, I think it's that guy uh, who was the head of the Crazy 88 or something. And you have Michael Pox. I'm not quite sure who Michael Pox is. But yeah, that's the cast mm. of the first Kill Bill film. It was released in uh, October the 10th, 2003. So this month in 2003, it had a budget of 30 million and it made over 180 million, which is not bad for a Tarantino film. Yeah. It's amazing. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Is he's it, not trying to chase blockbusters. Yeah. 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 Um, what I like about this film is, well, okay, just before we get to just a bit of trivia. So Tarantino wanted to do a three-hour movie, if I'm not mistaken. But then the studio yeah. said, no, um, you're not doing a three-hour movie. <laughs> so he chopped it off into two volumes. Um, mm. And I believe he did a just decent job because both of these movies are really good. I don't think yes. one is less superior than, than the other. They're both Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Um, and I like the fact that he was still able to make a great villain, even though the villain was not Bill in the first one. He still, mm. he still made that villain a, a pretty decent villain, if that makes sense. Oh, a yeah. fantastic one. Lucy Liu yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, as Oren Ishii. Yeah, so it's basically a revenge film, but doesn't necessarily feel like a revenge film, like a typical revenge film, if that makes sense. Because usually yeah, when which... we do movies, yeah. there's a hero's journey, right, mm -hmm. that we are mostly familiar with, where the hero does something, uh, has an obstacle in their path, and then, you know, there's a, maybe a training sequence or training montage or whatever, then... There's a love interest, and then at the end, mm. they fight the villain. But in this case, it's nothing like that. This person was already a master in martial arts. Um, she was actually a member of the people that she's fighting against. <laughs> yes. And 
So it, that is different because usually, you know, it's a black and white, good versus bad um, film. Mm-hmm. But she was one of the villains. She was an assassin. Yes. Yeah. And I think that was an interesting take. Um. Yeah, I think the way he told it was was what made it special, definitely. Because um, there's one thing Tarantino always talk about is about making genre films. And mm. I feel like it still manages to fulfill a lot of the genre, genre conventions. I wouldn't say tropes, conventions, the rules to make a genre thing like John Wick style, while kind of sprinkling the story backwards. So you kind of find out things along the way, mm. as opposed to, you know, having to see everything in one big go, while at the mm. same time being pretty intense. I mean, that Vivica Fox fight scene is fantastic. I mean, just the way they set things up is pretty great. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, you're right. I think it's, you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but writing a story that starts from, I wouldn't say from the beginning, but it starts from, <laughs> I guess, the middle. And you now have to sort of pay attention and sort of put pieces of the puzzle together by yourself as you're watching. It, mm-hmm. it, it is quite interesting. I just don't know how you how one approaches such a project, how they write these things, whether they have the story figured out in their heads, but they decide to, you know, put these bits and pieces together in different parts well, of the movie. Definitely or, that Tarantino already had, since he wrote the script already, like he already had a clear vision of what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But you listen to um, some of the back behind the scenes stuff, talking to Umo Thurman and kind of figuring out the different characters, you realize that Tarantino basically had a skeleton and then he was just willing to kind of take in people's advice. Like the idea of her wearing a bride's outfit, that was mm. Uma Thurman's idea. Like, because he, he already had Uma Thurman in mind as he was writing the script, basically. Right, right. And then, you know, this blew my mind because I always thought Shanghai Night, Shanghai Noon came before um, Kill Bull, but I guess not because it turns out he was watching Shanghai Noon and um, he saw Lucy Liu and was like, Holy cow, she's amazing. Because she wanted to make the she wanted to make he wanted to make her Japanese 100 percent But he was just like, Lucy Liu is so good at this. I'm going to change that entire character, make them Asian American. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that whole big scene with her, she cuts the guy's head off and is like, if you disparage my um, heritage even once, you know what I mean? I'll cut your fucking head off. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that stuff is improvised along the way. Um, That's never, if anybody wants to, if anybody has anything to say, no, it's the fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Absolutely fantastic the way he manages to, because I think there's something that Tarantino touched upon that I think is brilliant. And that's if you love storytelling enough, like if you're obsessed with it, you can't help but write a good story because yes, he man, he had a script obviously in mind in the beginning, but then because he, he could deviate for it and come back because he's so passionate about it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. And, like, for example, I actually think he low-key decided to tell the, the dramatic story of Kill Bill backwards. Like, because there's something uh, Zack Snyder talked about once, well, the writers for um, 300, about how the character of Leonidas has a straight line um, story arc. Like some people's character arcs will go up. Guardians of the Galaxy is a good example of like, you know, you kind of see um, Peter. What's it? Is it Peter? Is that his name? Peter Quill, yeah. Yeah. Starting at a certain level and then like being all careless and stuff like that. And he kind of has to, becomes forced to care. Mm. Whereas um, if you think about it, at least in the first Kill Bill, it kind of changes in the second one. Where in the first one, she's just cold blooded from beginning to end. She's still got her conventions and her rules, but she just, straight all the way through mm. you know what i mean and mm. but the flashbacks of her like is it in the first or the second movie where she finds out she's pregnant that flashback with the shotgun with the shotgun girl i think uh, it's the second one because the second one basically shows you what happens because it was a whole um wedding uh, rehearsal mm-hmm. and we see that she, no 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 it must have been was it the first one I think it was this, the, the second one. I don't know. Because I know the cartoon mode as well. I think that's in the second one as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's all the second one. So you really do get little sprinkles. But it's all just a perfect straight line. 
Mm. Technically, one could argue Naruto is kind of the same in the way that um, the actual Naruto's arc with his talk no jutsu is a straight line, but it's everyone around him who changes. The only mm. difference is this one, everyone around her dies. <laughs> Right, right, right. So I like, I like what you mentioned. That, well, let's just talk about um, the casting choices. I think nobody mm-hmm. was miscast in this movie. Yeah. Um, you, you did mention Lucy Lou. I mean, Lucy Lou at this point was having a great uh, trajectory in terms of her career. I mean, she had done, like you said, I mean, okay, she had done Charlie's Angels. And mm-hmm. then she, I think she did, like you said, Shanghai Noon. Obviously, she was... Uh, doing Ellie McDeal for a while, exactly. so she was she was basically on a on a on a on a high. Yeah, uh, and then she yeah. uh, she also did Charlie's Angel Full Throttle. I think probably yeah. after Kill Bill. Yeah, I think yeah after yeah, and then at some point didn't she do Afro Samurai uh, the second one? Yeah, yeah, she did. She did. Yeah. Um, what and else she did she do? Elementary, Elementary, the Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Yes, and then she was also in Men, Men of the Iron Fists with uh, the RZA. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm assuming yeah. that's, I mean, that's because Tarantino and thing was, you know what, let's keep working together. Yeah. 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 Tarantino was involved in that movie. I'm not sure the specific role he was in. I don't think yeah. he was there. No, no, he wasn't the director, but he was involved, you're right. Um, so, yeah, man, it was, it was, it was, I mean, she, uh, still a performance. Stella, Stella, Stella performance. Um, so anyway, the movie, I don't even remember how it starts, to be honest with you. I do know that she was in a coma. It starts with basically, okay, it's intense. Okay, it starts with um, her, like, all with blood all over herself. She's, like, she's wearing the wedding dress, and then she's, like, trying to say something, and she gets shot in the head. They yeah. cut to um, the, the hospital bed, and... You find out she's been in a coma for years or something like that. Yes, yes. And some guy has been like abusing her in her in her coma state, which is messed right. up. Right. And um, yeah, doesn't she like wake up by like cutting his tongue, biting his tongue off? Or something yeah, like that? I think I think she gained consciousness, but still acted to like she was still in a coma because yeah. I think she started figuring out what this guy was doing to her. Mm-hmm. And then she's that, that cool scene where she's like, okay, move your big toe. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what she did is after she bit the guy's tongue, she yeah. took the guy's keys, went mm-hmm. to the parking lot, figured out which car this guy drives. Yes. Uh, and then the P wagon gets inside. Well, she was struggling to move her feet because she hasn't been, she didn't yeah. get that whole physical therapy thing after getting exactly. shot, I'm assuming, because she was in a coma on and so basically, she just had to now, I guess... Move her muscles, yes. Yes, train herself to move her muscles without a doctor being present, <laughs> which is pretty badass. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she actually... Yeah, yeah, she eventually learns to wiggle her toes. Um, mm-hmm. And then the first place that she goes is uh, <laughs> Vivica A. Fox's place. Yeah, yeah. I think she was in Better Green. So was that her name? I believe so. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just to give a bit of background. So basically, she was a member of Bill, uh, Bill's Assassins. Um, I think there's the Viper Assassination Squad or something like that. I believe so. Yes. And uh, she was called. What was the nickname? <laughs> you you know me and names, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot a name because everybody had a nickname. Um, but because okay, we do call her the bride, but I don't think she was the bride at the time, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so she finds oh, she her the code name was Black Mamba. Ah. And and she was part of the Deadly Viper Assassination Squad. Yes. Um, and also she's called the deadliest woman in the world. I mean, she she was basically an all-rounder, she knew how to use guns. She could use swords, and she was a good hand-to-hand combatant. And you could tell that she she was not weak-willed. Like she she <laughs> she didn't need anyone to convince her or to motivate her to do anything. You know, she yeah. relied on herself. Of course, 
Yeah. Which is yeah. a very powerful. See, something that I like about writing is, but it's really hard to do. It's, and I think a lot of us as writers, we forget this. It's okay. sometimes you need one scene that does a lot. Um, like, for example, that big toe scene. Mm. What on earth could be a better way of proving it that you're a creature of pure willpower than that big toe scene? I mean, we just discussed, you're supposed to go through physical therapy, but you yeah. didn't. Pure willpower. Yeah. Another right. example would be um, the movie There Will Be Blood. Um, basically, what happens there is um, him and the guy are mining for gold, but they accidentally end up finding a little bit of gold and then finding oil. And then um, he has to, but then the one guy dies and then he gets injured and he literally has to crawl his ass um, across open plains for kilometers upon kilometers to get to the nearest town, cash in the gold and then come back for the oil. Oh my goodness. So like that little bit, that little opener sets up who your character is perfectly. You mm. know, like Indiana mm. Jones as well. The whole going after the temple at the beginning sets up the character perfectly. Right. And I think sometimes people forget that you need something like that. And it hits, you know what I mean? Mm, mm. A hook. Good. Yeah, mm. yeah, a hook. Yes, exactly. That's perfect. Yes, I forgot the name. Yes. A hooking yeah. scene. Yes. Yeah. No, that's so true. That, so that sets it up. So now we know that Kilt is a creature of pure will. Mm. So when she comes and she's already better. And she's already healthy and she's going after the American Fox. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And she makes sure to go basically during the day because she knows that everybody's gone to well. Most people have gone to work. It's yeah. the perfect time to go and attack somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, hardly any witnesses around that time. So yeah. she goes to Venita Green, code name Copperhead. <laughs> and um how Vivica A. Fox actually got cast in this role was Quentin saw her in he got uh, two can play that game, which mm. is quite funny because you're seeing Lucy Liu in Shanghai Noon, which is an action yeah. show, mm -hmm. and Lucy Liu barely does any action in that. She's basically a damsel in distress, if you remember correctly. Yeah. Um, for the most part. Yeah. But Tarantino saw something that really didn't kill me. I mean, obviously. She was in Chinese Angels, so we knew she could kick ass. But in that movie, Jackie Chan was doing most of the heavy lifting. Then you have Two Can Play That Game, which is not an action movie at all. It's a romantic comedy. But like, again, Tarantino saw something. So you could tell that Tarantino looks for, and I could be wrong, you could correct me here. Yeah, yeah. He, looks for, he looks for stellar performance. Yes, because and he knows that he can use he can use an actress or an actor who is really good at acting to do whatever he wants him to do. Yes, it's kind of like soccer. When you watch Lionel Messi play, you see his highlights. Mm -hmm. um, when you see him like dribbling through someone and he scores a goal, um, there's a reason why Messi is like one of the greatest people of all time, and like Ronaldinho. He who even though is one of the greatest players of all time, just doesn't have the same acclaim. Because a lot of most things lead to goals. And in a way, that's kind of how acting is. It's all cool that you can cry on cue. But if you don't cry on cue at the right speed to produce X, Y result, it doesn't mean mm. it. And what's his Tarantino? No, he he basically studies that because he acted a little bit and he knows what it means to have proper timing. In the same way that a comedian can tell when you have good comedic timing. Right. Right. It's, it's his passion. He's an actor's director. I mean, yeah. he will brutalize people. Don't get me wrong. He will brutalize you at some point. Um, I know, I think Uma Thurman had a hard time with the second kill bull because I think something yes. happened to her. Um, I think there was a scene where she was driving. Mm. Uh, you remember that scene where I think she was driving to Mexico or something, and she yeah. she had a car accident on the yeah. way there. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, I, yeah. When you when you come that tough, like I think Tarantino even for Inglorious Bastards, like choked that. I think she he choked her himself. Oh, the Kruger. Uh, yeah, and she nearly passed out, right? Yeah. 
which is so funny because technically a lot of guys have this happen to them all the time. But um, but the point is, yeah, you kind of go through this hell. But mm. and again, don't get me started with Christian Bale. Who <laughs> 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 knows his hell? Like at one, yeah. in one thing, I forgot the movie was called now. The one where he won the Oscar. No, no, not the one they won the Oscar. Um, the one after that one. The one with um, uh, the fighter. No, the one after the fighter. Same director, um, Christian Bale as well. But he had to be like chubby in that one. And they're like, it's fine. We're going to give you a beer belly. And then he was like, no, it's cool. 20 cheeseburgers a day, some shit like that. Deliberately gave himself a beer belly just for the role, because that's just who he is. Uh, was it not Hustle? Was it Hustle? Yes, Hustle, yes. With the FBI, with with, Bernan- with uh, Br- Bradley Cooper. <laughs> yes, Bradley Cooper, Bernenthal, and Jennifer, uh, Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence, and Amy Adams, and yes. uh, Jeremy Renner. <clears throat> Brilliant yeah. movie. Brilliant, brilliant movie. Great director that we need to talk about at some point. I've forgotten his name, but that man is basically that man just walks into the Oscar room basically and like, <laughs> and, and takes his award. <laughs> you know, a nomination because he's just he's an actor's director, you can tell. Mm-hmm. I mean, he manages to round up these guys. What Jennifer Lawrence has been like three of his movies. Um wow. I mean yeah. he got De Niro as well in one of the movies in, in the hustle. Like yeah. Hustle has a has an ensemble cast. Like they has a great ensemble. And I think it's because they know he's an actor's director, so they know that mm. we should really talk about it at some point. Yeah. Point. Um because um, I mean you see that with Nolan as well in Oppenheimer. Almost everybody you can think of is in that movie. <laughs> Almost everybody. True. Because they know they could they could they can like an opportunity to pull off something amazing, definitely. Mm. And mm. then there are times mm. where directors where they just get to play almost. You kind of get to chill in the room with the person and kind of hit something special. Mm. Like I think David Fincher is obviously brutal to actors. You know, having to having to dig deep, right? And yeah. pull out emotion and then be right. told if you 14 more times. <laughs> That's brutal yeah. for an actor. Whereas yeah. Scorsese, who's like, I'm just gonna, okay, you guys know what the script is about, right? So we're gonna rip this up. Okay, go for it. Or like um Coppola. I feel like yeah. I feel like Taika Waititi is like that as well. I could be wrong, but that's the vibe that I get from him. That's an interesting one, actually. I don't know. Because clearly, with Ragnarok, I mean, not Ragnarok, uh, what was the last one he did? L- Love and Thunder. Love and Thunder. Something clearly went wrong there. And Chris Hemsworth wasn't happy. Mm. And so, I don't know. I feel like maybe, maybe he's like that when it is personal projects, like Jojo Rabbit. You know what I mean? Which is which is something which is a movie maybe we should touch on because that is a brilliant movie. I mm. mean, the first 30 minutes I was like, what the hell is happening here? But as you keep going, you're like, my goodness, what an amazing movie. I'm not just like see- reading a book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds great. But now apparently people are roasting the new one, so I don't know what that's about. The, the sp- new one. Yeah. Uh, his Waititi movie, the one where he's like, um, uh, like a New Zealand soccer team or something like that, or some Pacific Island soccer team, and they just have to score one goal. If they can just do that, then they'll be happy or something like that. It's a comedy. Oh, you've heard of it? Mm-mm. Yeah, apparently it's not good. It's not doing great at Rotten Tomatoes. So now everyone's like, has Waititi lost it after Love and Thunder? What's going on? Mm. Ish, dude, being a director is tough. Yeah, being a being a director is either hit or miss. I mean, it's basically M Night Shyamalan or Ryan it, Johnson. M Night, you <laughs> see M Night right there, yeah. Because M Night is like what? It's like good movie flop, good movie flop, good movie flop, good movie flop. <laughs> Some of the worst movies you ever seen in your life, and you're like, how can I, how can someone who made um, the Sixth make- Sense? Six cents be making um the happy- split. Yeah, no, no, don't even start on Avatar. You're- yeah, yeah. That was the worst movies of all time. How did he do that? That took effort. Yeah. What, what, why do people say that? Was it that bad? Did you not? You watched it, right? I watched it. <laughs> I watched it. Okay, come on, as a writer. There's a scene where, like, okay, did you watch a TV show first or did you watch a movie first? 
I watched the TV show first. So you did watch the TV show and you liked it? Yeah. Okay, so then book one, right? Ahsoka mm-hmm. and the um, the other chick, right? Mm. That was a cool moment of them like bonding and then it kind of has a tragedy for Ahsoka. You mean the, the moon spirit? Yes. Mm. In the movie, they're like, her and Ahsoka became good friends. Oh, you're not going to show us anything. Oh, great. We'll just take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like the, the person who was miscast there was Dave Patel. Um, not that he was, he was not horrible, but I mean, he also said it that look. Seriously, he didn't look bored. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know what, I think we'll, we'll talk about it some other time. Yes, we need uh, to. It's... Back to the movie. Um, so basically, yeah, she goes to Copperhead. Uh, and, you know, when they meet up, obviously, she's surprised that she's alive. Like, yo, you know, we thought you were dead. Um, and they're quite cool about it. Obviously, she's not sure what what Uma Thurman is going to do to her. Yes. But, but she's quite calm about it. She's because she knows that if anything happens, I have weapons planted anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah. ready for anything, you know. Um, so she makes a coffee or tea or something and they keep talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the baby comes in. No, but I think the baby comes in after they drew their, their weapons, right? No, I think what happens is the baby comes in, they fake it, right? Mm. Uh, the baby's about to go to school or something like that. So she goes to school, if I'm correct. So Wasn't baby. She back? I think she was back from school. No, I think what happened, she was going to school, which is why almost someone was going to attack. And then she came back. And that's why I was oh. shocked she was back. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so this, it was a quick fight. Oh, um, but, well, definitely, like... Vivica Fox was going all in, like she threw her whole body into that into that whole thing, like crazy energy. I think, she, mm. yeah, like with the pot and the knife, that was some old school kung fu right there. Like that was some <laughs> well done. But you see, I think at that time, the Bond, Paul, Paul Greengrass's Bond films had probably been released. Probably Bond, Bond Identity must have been released at that time. And even uh, Bond Supremacy, I think. I could yeah. be wrong there. No, you could be right, but at the same time, no shaky cam. And the camera was not yeah. as they were wide shots, no shaky cams. Yes. But I agree, yes. lots of cuts, lots of energy. But uh, Paul Greengrass's shaky cam, which by the way is good shaky cam. Let's not yes. put him under. Because yes. he he has purpose to a shaky cam. There's an art form to it where right. you put um, whereas other people are just doing it to slow down things. Like Jackie Chan even talks or about... Or to hide, or to hide, to hide uh, clunky choreography or whatever you want to call it. Exactly. Jackie Chan talks about if you can't fight, you do lots of cuts, you do lots of close-ups. If you can't <laughs> fight, you don't fight. Yeah. Right. Um, so the reason I mentioned Paul Greengrass is actually mm-hmm. this thing of Using whatever you find next to you as a weapon, not ah, necessarily. Yeah, because I mean, using a pen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, a pen versus a knife. That was yeah, that was something else. I mean, old school kung fu movies do it something similar. They'll yes. put overboard. They'll be like chopsticks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you like, buy it. You buy it. You're like. <laughs> You're like glued to your screen because you have no idea how powerful these choke sticks can be. <laughs> That's another thing. Oh my god, I wonder about kung fu, like modern kung fu. Because in that also kung fu movies, they used to hit you twice and then you died. Like you know, what? You which is like... something that which is something I think we're gonna mention in the second in the second volume because I mean that's how kill that's how Bill basically get, uh, is defeated. But yeah, we'll get the chick as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. That was one hit KO right there. But yeah. So basically, yeah. Um, I think she wanted to fetch a, a gun in the cereal box, and uh, obviously, 
they know each other, they know each other's moves, they know each other's way of thinking. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the bride saw it very early and she threw the knife, it hit yeah. her in the chest and she yeah. died instantly. Then the child was there watching everything and she's like, you know what? She tells the child, like, look, um, if you still feel raw about what you just saw now, a, few years, a couple of years down the line, look for me. Yeah. Look for me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you have every right to kill me, basically. Yes. We uh, and Afro Samurai. Oh, damn, man. The second Afro yeah. Samurai, they do that. Yeah. And I, 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 I guess it makes sense because she's doing what was done to her, basically. Yeah. She's getting her revenge, but it doesn't mean that this child should not get her revenge. Exactly. There's no, yeah. yeah, there's no acceptable context when it comes to revenge, 100%. Yes, yes. Um, and the next scene, what's the next big moment? So basically after the pussy wagon, then she decides, okay, you know what, I need to go to um, Japan. Because basically the idea was to, the idea was to uh, get a Hattori Hanzo sword. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I feel like we missed a very important scene. So basically, while she was in a coma, Daryl Hanna, the lady with the eye patch, she pretended yeah. to be a nurse and she was whistling at the hospital. <laughs> so basically, she had an injection. Um, I believe that she wanted to basically just finish, finish. the job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just don't remember what... Oh, I think Bill called. Mm. And I think he said that he, she shouldn't um, go, go go with it. Like, she shouldn't continue with, with that thing. And she was she was disappointed. Like, why? Why are we not killing her? I don't get it. But, yeah, I mean, get, Bill is the boss. So if he says, don't do it, you don't do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So anyway, um, she goes to Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, when she gets there, she goes to this restaurant and she meets this store owner, uh, mm -hmm. played by Sony Chiba. Um, and they keep talking and obviously they just think she's just a foreigner who just wants to get a Japanese experience. Mm -hmm. But then they realize that <laughs> it seems like this one came for a specific reason, a reason that that precedes this man's um, career as a shop owner or a noodle-making businessman. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, I came here because I want to kill Bill. Eh? <laughs> or or, or she said, either she said that or she said, I want a Hattori Hanzo sword, one of the two. Yeah. And the man is like, you want the Hattori Hanzo sword? Why? Because I need to kill a man. <laughs> so basically, right to kill a what? rat, or kill some vermin, right? Doesn't you say that? Oh, kill I need to kill a vermin. Yes, 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 yes. There must be some very really big rats if you want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, basically, she then gets accommodation from this man for a couple of days. Uh, so he forges a sword, a Hattori Hanzo sword, which is considered to be one of the most powerful swords of, um, you know, made by man. It's mm -hmm. Apparently, it's so powerful that it can even cut God or something like that, according to the narration. Um, hey, Japanese. What's that? <laughs> um, you try to use, the anime starts by you trying to save a cat, and by the end of it, you're killing God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think fun fact is Sony Chiba played Hattori Hanzo twice. Mm. Uh, in the olden days, I think he played another, a, a certain version of Hattori Hanzo, whether a descendant or something. And then in this one, he also plays another descendant of Hattori Hanzo. Yeah. Uh, so that was cool, man. Like you mm. can tell that Tarantino actually knows his stuff. He does a lot of research. Through the movies that he watches. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, even the music that they play there was something he heard one day randomly, and he was like, this track is amazing. And instead of Shazamming, he flew to Japan. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's just 
That's how much money we need, guys. To... <laughs> mm, I mean, most movies, that's what they do. I mean, I know Nolan would take a year just to read a book about a movie that he wants to do. Like, oh, if there's a project that is based on a book, he would read the book for an entire year, do the research uh, within that year, I mean, mm-hmm. do something like grow, growing crops. Yeah. Crazy. And crazy. Crazy. And on another level is, of course, um, um, Stanley Kubrick, who did so much research that his house is now a museum of the research. Pages upon pages of notes, pages upon pages mm-hmm. of thematics. Page, you, it's crazy. I've seen some pictures and some video. It is insane how much of it it is. Like just general knowledge? Um, no, research for the scenes that he's setting up. Because remember, he never writes the book. He's he said to himself, I am not a writer. He gave that up. He said, I just want to be the guy that converts it. So, like he would of course like write a script, convert it. Then he'd be like, okay, the script isn't good enough. So he'd write a new script, convert it, do new research, find out some more data, do more XYZs, 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 models, all that stuff is being set up. And then eventually, eventually, after like years, the movie will start being made. Yeah, it makes sense. And I guess that's why mm. his movies are considered to be one of the best movies of all time. I mean, someone made a commentary that mm. Kubrick has done different genres in his entire filmography. Yeah. And uh, you, you can't say one genre is weaker than the other. And the fact that someone is saying that, it makes you realize how much passion. Yeah, I mean, Eyes Watch Shut was is based on a book. I had no idea that it was based on yeah. a book. Yeah, all of it, none and, of it is, yeah, none of it is based on original material like that he Oh, made. even The Shining, even The Shining, obviously is based Shining, on. of course, that's the most famous one, which is ironic, because that's the one I think the writer didn't yeah. like. Stephen only King didn't, didn't like it. I don't know why he didn't like it. Because he liked The Social Redemption. Which is so strange, right? But here's the thing about Stephen King. They once gave him money to make his own movie. And it's the weirdest garbage you've ever seen in your life. And you're like, okay, but what is going on, Stephen King? It's a, he made his own movie where a truck comes to life, where trucks come out to life and start attacking people. Um, <laughs> and these people are stuck in a gas station and these trucks are outside. That's, that's Stephen King's brain. <laughs> so it's Which film is this? It was some weird eight nineties eighties movie, dude. It's so flippin' weird. It's hilarious. You should watch the you know nostalgia critic. What? Nostalgia critic. Nostalgia critic. Uh, yes, I've heard about nostalgia. Yes, yes, I've seen a few videos. I think. Yeah, exactly. He's he's how I discovered this. Um, just and the thing is, it's not it's not made ironically, but you would think it was a comedy, like made ironically, like you know what I mean. In that mm-hmm. about- Mm, like, like, guess if it's a parody of, of or, or, or satire or whatever. Exactly. So Same. I don't know if Stephen King doesn't take himself too, I don't know if it's because he doesn't take himself too seriously or because maybe a lot of his ideas are more silly than the rest of us realize. Like, we take him too seriously. Yes. You know or, what I mean? Or he takes, he takes things that you shouldn't take seriously very seriously, if that makes sense, and vice yeah. versa. And the things that you shouldn't take seriously, he takes seriously. <laughs> I mean, the things that, that are serious, ah, the things that are not serious, he takes serious, ah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, think about it. It's a book. I mean, The Shining is a book about a hotel that eats people. Like, you know, that ruined it. Like, I don't know what the hell. You know I mean? <laughs> or like, um, The Langoliers is mm-hmm. about um, the time gets eaten. And if you get messed up, if you get left behind time, then you'll be eaten as well. Um, I don't know. Um, Tommy Knockers is about a spaceship in a, yeah, like it, there's a lot of weird things in Stephen King novels. I've read a lot of his books. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's just a style, I guess. But yeah, anyway, let's <laughs> next. Yeah. yeah. So basically, yeah, this sword is forged, but uh, yes, it is meant to kill Bill. But now that this sword, uh, this sword is made, which is something that Hattori Hanzo has not made done in a very long time. Which, He's not forced this on in a very long time. And we find out that he is actually a, a master of Bill. He's the, the last sword that he made, he made for Bill. Mm. You know? And um, anyway, after that whole thing, now 
Um, she's out for blood. Um, mm -hmm. She's ready. And, and, and you know, <laughs> so now we get a backstory of the person that she's going after, which is Oren mm -hmm. Ishii. We discover that Oren Ishii is half Chinese, half Japanese, half American. Um, so yeah, basically that was changed, like you said earlier on. That mm -hmm. whole nationality was changed so that it fits Lucy Lu's character because she, I think she grew up in America and I think she's Chinese. Or something yeah. like that. And um, real life is Chinese, but America, Chinese American, yes. But yes. now you can't just it's not sometimes it's better to change the backstory than try to make someone lie. If if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Uh, if you yeah. Like if you force someone to try and sound Spanish mm. and they butcher Spanish. Mm -hmm. You, and you're a Spanish-speaking person, that can throw you off completely. But yeah. if you find an actor that happens to have grown in Spain, but you find that they are African-American, then when they speak Spanish, you're like, oh my goodness, this guy is convincing, only to find out, no, this guy grew up in Spain, you just didn't know. You know? Uh, so it's more convincing. Yes. And I think that's that's also... Some of the advantages that we South African, uh, uh, South Africans have, especially the actors. I'm thinking of uh, the guy, um, the guy, what's his name? Let's say Shaw. Kaluva. Kaluva. I forgot his first name. I think it's Kaluva or something. I forgot. But he he used to play Jason on Generations, and he was like the main protagonist in Gomorrah. He was a the principal there. The guy can speak Corsa, can speak English, can speak Sichuan, you know? So you can put him anywhere and he can kill it, you know? Exactly. But also, like you said, Chateau Copley is a good example. In Elysium, he has this Afrikaner accent. Yeah. But when you watch the A-team, you don't even feel like he doesn't belong there. Like his English, his, his American accent is on point. <laughs> yeah. And even though I'm not a fan of the American version of the old boy movie, I thought that posh British thing that he was doing was pretty funny. I, I enjoyed it a lot, man. Oh, he did he did British as well. Yeah, in the movie Old Boy. I haven't seen that one. Okay, watch the original Korean. Don't even watch the American one. Not worth it. But definitely one of the best movies of all time. But oh yeah, we did say we, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do remakes in the future. Oh, yes, we should. Yes, yes, definitely. That's going to be a thing. Because uh, you made me think about Death at a Funeral. Like mm -hmm. the American version is Death at, Death at a Funeral. Yep, same. The American version is a, is a frame by frame, word for word version of the British. They even get, um, what is this? Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage, who was in the British. Oh. <laughs> to be the American, and I'm like, wow, two different performances, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, we need to put that in there. Yeah, yeah. you can kind of tell. And what's so nice about it being frame by frame is you can kind of tell, okay, yeah, this is where the Black American part comes in, and like the British yes, yes. part comes no, in. No, that's true. That's true because yeah. obviously Chris Rock does his thing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, when it starts. I think Tracy Morgan gets some Asian guys. Like, you can take a chain up in here, man. Kevin Hart. It's Kevin Hart. Oh, Kevin Hart, yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, I couldn't recognize I when I couldn't recognize him too. And it's like, no, you understand. It's an Asian person. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that movie was amazing. Yes. Um so, and but you see the the so the okay sometimes there's subtle differences but sometimes there's huge differences. Yeah, uh, I know we are off tangent, but I just want to make this point quickly. Mm -hmm. The scene where the main character says, "My father was a good man," right? The British version, you mm -hmm. instantly feel the shift in tone. You yeah. instantly buy the, the 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 moment because that whole movie was about well his arc was about him making the speech yeah. that he didn't prepare for. Yeah, when Chris Rock did it. I didn't feel it the same way I felt when I saw the British version. Not that Chris Rock didn't do a good job. He did a good job, but it just didn't have the same weight as the, the British version. I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes it's a, it's a cultural thing. 
like one of the best examples of that is Death Note. Um, you've watched anime, right? Yes. I watched the manga. I haven't watched the Netflix one. Cool. Well, you should just to okay. be upset. But um, <laughs> but I'm sorry, Lakeith. Uh, what is what is his name again? Lakeith Sutfield or Sir, the guy who plays L. Yes, I know. Yeah, he was probably good in there, right? I'm I'm assuming he was probably yeah, good. Thing, right. He's a good actor. He's like Jake Gyllenhaal. Yes. He's part out of everything, but that doesn't mean the director was doing the right thing. If right. that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Right. So, for example, um, here's the thing that someone once said, and I agree with it fully. With the Japanese one, right? It is a story of someone at the top sinking. Whereas, um, because Americans have a fundamental different thought process of that thing, they have so they put L um, right at the top, and then they crush him in the anime, right? Because it's Japanese. But then, in the in the um, American version, they can't. Like psychologically, they can't get that into their heads. So what they end up having to do is they force out to be an underdog. Mm. You know what I mean? They mm. force the mm. underdog so he has to work his way up emotionally. It's a very interesting thought process to the whole thing. And mm. I would love mm. that at some point. I'm excited for that to happen. Okay. No, then I'll definitely do that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so basically we get this background that Oren Ishii basically was a daughter of a military man um, and basically one night and this is actually a, a segment or yeah a clip that was animated by production IG which is it's an anime sequence basically which is really well done and and it's quite heavy the music is great yeah uh, that 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 scene actually really scarred me man I don't want to lie to you but anyway it is, yeah um, again- Jarring, yeah. So I think uh, his dead old money, the old uh, uh, Yakuza boss money, mm-hmm. and uh, basically they came to, I guess, fetch the money. They couldn't, I mean, he couldn't pay, so then they wanted to kill him, but then um, he started fighting them off. Uh, obviously, he is outnumbered, and uh, here comes Bill, and he basically kills this guy with the sword and you see blood just coming out of it. I mean, that's what my cousin says that the guy who killed him was Bill, but I think it might have been because of the hair. You see the hair and you also see the sword. Yeah. And Oren, Oren Ishii is underneath the bed. She's still very young at the time. Um, I think the mom is also killed, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because she, the, the mob, uh, mob boss Threw her by the bed, and then he, I think he killed her with the sword. And then the sword almost, almost got to Oren Ishii, but obviously it just missed her a bit. Yeah. And then, yeah, she burned the house, burned her parents, and she was out for revenge from that day forward. She grew older. In high school, she pretended to be a prostitute. Uh, was able to get into the mob boss's house and. Just as they were about to have sex, knowing very well that this guy is going to be vulnerable, mm. takes the sword and kills him. Yep. Beautiful scene. I mean, it was so bad. It was so hectic that <laughs> I think one of his two teeth came out because he was, what do you call this word? Is it clinching your teeth? Yeah. Clinching your teeth, yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, anyway, after that, then she became a professional assassin. And mm. uh, they show her killing, I think it was a president of something. Uh, you mean the sniper scene, right? With the car? Yes, yeah, with the car, yeah. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah. But anyway, the, yeah, she was just giving us background to that. And yeah. uh, basically... So she was just also telling us that the only way for her to get access to wherever Oren Ishii is, is to follow Sophie Fatal, which is this half French, half, I think, American lady. Yeah. Um, I just don't remember where Sophie was at the time. 
Carol Lamb drawing a blank on the scene as well. I mean, I know I she think was, she was she was at a club, I think, but she was going somewhere else. So she was fetching her. She was basically chasing after her. That's what she was wearing the yellow, and then they were playing the bumblebee in the background. <laughs> yes. And obviously, it's you could say it's it's paying homage to Bruce Lee's yellow. Yeah, of course um, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow attire and Game of Death. Oh, uh, Game of Death, you're right, Game of Death, you're right. Not yeah. Into the Dragon, Game of Death, yes. And, uh, yeah, basically, she manages to uh, stop Sophie just as she gets out of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, Make sure to enter that, uh, what's that, what's the name of that <laughs> restaurant? <laughs> the Crazy 88 home base. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so basically, um, she does, yo. Oh, it's an iconic mo- moment. Mm-hmm. Obviously, when she gets in, everybody's like, what the hell? Who would do this to Sophie? Who would touch Sophie like this? Are they insane? Do they know who they are touching? This is Sophie we're talking about. Anyway, uh, the crazy a- one of the members of the Crazy 88 obviously tells Gordon Ishii that, yo, Sophie's out. Uh, she's being held by this guy, this or whoever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... The bride sends a message, chops off uh, Sophie's arm, mm. blood spilling everywhere. Obviously, this means war. And yeah. uh, Oren Ishii says something, which is a, a legendary uh, uh, line for me. Mashi mama! Which means, <laughs> I think it means get that bitch or kill that bitch or something. And man, we get one of the best moments, I guess, in film history. Yep. They would just- say, Pardon? Yeah, I think they went to Hong Kong to shoot this whole section, I believe. Oh, is it? I believe so, yes. Apparently, long, sleepless nights, dude. Like Tarantino would like come in and be like, hey, guys, remember, we love film. Yeah. It will motivate it to like, keep, like, stay awake and keep, like, you know, pushing. It was yeah. tough for everyone. Yeah. And, and, you know, I guess... He was smart to turn that scene into black and white because there was just too much blood for the time. Yeah. Of and course. Because at, yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause at this moment, the bride chops off a lot of legs and a lot of arms and a lot of this and that and the third. It's just bloody. And just as you think that he, she's about to finish people off, more members of the crazy it, 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 yeah. it coming through. You would say you could say that it was like a Scarface scene at the end. Mm-hmm. Only instead of guns, they're using swords. Yeah. I mean, look, if any of them had a gun, it was over. She could have died. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> the movie would have ended right there. True, true, true. They yeah. are Japan because it makes more sense. Right. You know what I mean? If you said it in America, it doesn't make as much sense. Same thing yes. with old boy in Korea. Like, a lot of these fight scenes make a lot less sense in America. Yes, yes. Mm. Um, so, eventually, um, so you could say that Oren Ishii had two right-hand men or women. Okay, three. Because the first one is Sophie, as we've mentioned. Yeah, Who course. is directly under her. Then you yeah. have the ones who are, you could say they're under Sophie, who is um, the leader of the Crazy 88 and Gogo. Yes. Gogo is this high school student uh, Japanese girl who is heartless, bro. <laughs> like, like, Gogo is heartless, bro. And she doesn't care. You know, um, so basically there's a one-on-one uh, between the two of them and the bride is basically trying to tell Gogo, dude, I don't want to fight you. I don't want to kill you. Let's not do this. But Gogo doesn't listen. She's too stubborn. She's busy laughing there. You know, and uh, it was an intense scene. I don't, I won't lie. It was really, really good. I think it was well choreographed because absolutely every swing that Gogo makes, you are at the edge of your seats, biting your nails. You're just mm-hmm. hoping that the bride doesn't get catch wind of this thing. Otherwise, like it doesn't really touch her because if it does, she's gone. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, there's a point where it really seemed like it was over for her. Mm. Um, but uh, I just remember, remember what she did. But she managed to get that thing to 
it's like a chain. It's like a chain with a yeah. ball that has spikes on it. Yeah. Exactly, like a mace, basically. Yes. Yes. Uh, she basically comes up with a way to make sure that that thing goes back to Gogo and it hits Gogo in the head and she dies instantly, right? Or was it a was it a plank with nails or something? It was a plank with a nail. That's what got her. It was a plank with a nail. Hit her in the head and then that was it, yeah. Damn. Yeah, that was brutal. Because you could see blood coming out from her eyes. Yes. It was wow. a beautiful, beautiful, brutal moment. Yeah. Hard punching writing right there, man. Hard punching. The only person who survived throughout that entire okay, there are only two people that survived throughout that entire ordeal. Yes. Uh, the first one is the kid, because he was way too young to join the Yakuza in the first place. <laughs> so go back to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> go back to your mother. And then she goes back and looks and looks at the ones that she didn't kill, and she says, You have a choice to leave now, but as you leave, don't pick up any of your legs or your hands or anything. Those are mine. <laughs> you just know Tarantino lost his shit when he wrote that. He was like, This is lost his mind right there. Yeah, that was definitely a death note moment. <laughs> yep. And I was probably laughing every single time he was writing something. Beautiful, so man. So eventually we see her approaching Oren Ishii. But before we get there, I just want to say that uh, mm-hmm. part of the background story of Oren Ishii is, although she was um, the head of uh, some Yakuza family, she was mm-hmm. not easily accepted by yeah. full-blooded Japanese Yakuza uh, dons. Mm-hmm. Um, one in particular who was very vocal made it clear that look, we're not going to be led by a woman. First of all, second of all, she's not Japan, full blooded Japanese. Uh, what are we doing here? Uh, as she was speaking, she was speaking, Oren, <laughs> I want to bite immediately. Let's just, yeah, just respond to that immediately. No, runs, instantly runs and chops his head off. And I think the fact that the fact that they did the baby footsteps, like, yeah. <laughs> and, great. and even how she sort of, I mean, that's why I think she was just showing off her acting chops. She's yeah. like, you know what, now I'm not gonna speak in Japanese, I'm gonna speak in English. And Sophie basically just translates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a nice moment. Yeah. That was a very nice moment. She was basically just, um, I guess you could say it's a display of power, obviously yeah. an abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more then, technique where the bad guy normally has to do something to show off, you know what I mean? Yeah. But quick, well, you know, the setup with the English, with the translating was smooth and slow, but the actual moment itself, the moment of violence itself, it's quick, brutal. And uh, look, I guess you could say, maybe I'm reaching, but you could say using an American, speaking in, um, in, in English, mm-hmm. in an American accent towards the Japanese, knowing the history between the Japanese and the American is sort of like a spit in the face as well. <laughs> I would have said, yes, her speaking her own vernac is a power play. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't think Tarantino thought that far ahead, but I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think she, he thought that far ahead as well, but mm. I don't know. It just came to mind now as we speak. I'm like, hmm, now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it could be. So, it could be. But anyway, we get to basically the final act where it's the bride versus Oran Ishii. Um, they are in a room that, no, they're outside, but they're upstairs, outside, right? Upstairs, yes. In one of those, one uh, of those, one of those, what's it called? Peach blossoms or whatever? And, or cherry it, blossoms. Yeah, cherry blossoms or snow, I can't forget, but it was like something was it, falling. It was, snow, it was snowing. It snow. was snowing. Yeah. You're right. It was yeah. snowing. Yeah. Um. So basically, it's a duel between these two swords women. And there was that whole thing that the Japanese like that bamboo water thing. Like, 
I don't know what to call it, and I don't know what the symbolism of it is, but you see it a lot in anime as well. Mm. Um, anyway, so it's a heat at the battle, and um... ah, dude, the whole like this, the, that's when the whole sword play comes to play because at first Lucy Lou is super confident that she has a, a Tanzo sword, so the way did you say to she has a sword? I think so, but she's all confident and she's like that. Then it turns out, then she's like, thing when she cuts her, and she's like, ah, okay, now you got the real deal. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember there's a part where she, the bright cuts on an issue just a little bit, and you see her limping, but she's still, you know, holding yeah. the sword. It's a beautiful scene. Because you see drips of blood. Like this entire place is white. She's wearing white. Uh, Beatrix is wearing yellow, and then the only red things that you see are just drops of blood on yeah. the floor. Um, that, and th that, yes, yeah, and uh, yeah, basically, Beatrix chops off like just a, a little bit of the top here. One, two, that Osaka tried to copy, yeah, um, yeah, the final slash, and then like top of the, the forehead, basically, yeah. And then Lucy Lu says something like, oh, this is the real Hattori Hanzo sword. Mm. <laughs> and then she goes down. And yeah. uh, after that, Beatrix basically goes downstairs, takes uh, Sophie, takes her to the hospital, mm -hmm. uh, and just pushes her <laughs> from like a hill or something. And she keeps rolling, rolling until she lands into the hospital. Then they see her. Then they obviously they put her on a on a stretch or whatever you call it, uh, yeah. stretcher. Yeah, and um, Bill enters. Okay, but b before that, they show us what the bride was telling Sophie. Mm. And then she was like, look, I have a message for Bill. Uh, I just don't remember what she said. Hey, dude, I watched this a long time ago. I don't remember the message But I, I think it was around the... Uh, we could say something like, I'm not dead, I'm alive, um, yeah. and I'm out to get you. I think that, yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to come and sort you out. Mm. And yeah, Sophie was pretty much upset because, you know, she had failed Bill, and mm -hmm. she was crying, and Bill was like, no, it's okay, Sophie. <laughs> um, I just don't remember how it ended, but I think he alluded to the fact that the baby's alive. So I, I'm not sure. Possible. Gosh, I can't remember the after credit scene. Well, the final scene, not the after credit scene. Yeah. Not properly happened yet. Um, but he did say something that would basically give us the impression that there's a part two coming. There's a sequel coming. I can't remember the last line. We'd have to look it up. And I'm already... Yeah. <laughs> I think it was something with, uh, around the... Either around the lines of... Does he know? Does she know her daughter's alive, or yeah. something like? You're right. I think that is actually. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, but yeah, that's basically kill Bill. This time, I think we we re we went around it a, a bit quicker than the others. But no, I, I don't think it was quicker. I think what the problem is is that a lot of problem. I think the thing is about Tarantino with this one is there are a lot less beats, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot less. Things happen. Instead, right. it's more about the spectacle of the event itself. Right. Think about right. John Wick. A lot of things happen, especially in John Wick 4. So many things happen that almost don't have to happen. Like that black yeah, guy. It was, it was unnecessarily long. Eh? Yeah. And, and then, yeah, the, the black guy with the dog. Yeah. He, I think if you removed him from the entire show, nothing changes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think he's the tracker, but come on. And just... even even Kane for the most part. Mm. Even the Russian, um, what's the Scott Atkins character? The fat Russian. Yes, that, that was such a long scene. What the hell? Unnecessary. Happened? Unnecessary. Yeah, the whole poker scene shouldn't have happened. He should have just shown up and went, I'm here for your neck. And then the, then the whole um, party fight happens. That should yeah. have happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. They should have cut the thing with Jiggy in half a little bit. Um, but so many, okay, it's not even that it took long. It's that things kept happening. And you're mm. like, oh, this is, so Tarantino's one is almost the opposite. Like yeah. one, 
assume we're in Japan now. They yeah. need the thing. They, she got the thing. She right. ends up immediately at the main, main guy's base. She doesn't have to look for it. She doesn't right. have to make heist first. Nope. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and all of that stuff, like a lot of this deep stuff happens in the second movie. Yes. Yeah. I just want to come, I just want to verify something. Was Sophie part of the Deadly Vampire Assassination Squad or was she just, or exactly. she is, she yeah, was think, part of the squad, no? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because Madison, because how many, there's like five people there. I don't think she's even in the flashback. I think she just trying to show up as an assistant or something like that. Oh yeah, she's just or an issue is assistant, no? or rather kill, kill, or rather build assistant or something. Because yes. um, I was reading comments a few days ago, a couple of days ago, and they were saying Sophie actually didn't do anything to the bride. Like she, she wasn't part of the people that were yeah she's basically like terrorizing. Yeah, but unfortunately, an example had to be made out of her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so people were just saying the fact that she's part of that gang makes her an accomplice of sorts. Yeah, that's or good. Comparable. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you can be sad about Sophie, then watch the entire Crazy 888 get massacred and be like, what, what, what did Sophie do? Nah! <laughs> and also, someone did mention that in real life, Sophie would have died a long time ago because she lost a lot of blood, eh? Oh, yeah, of course. You, you can't just... And then, like, no one was helping her until the hospital, the roll down the hill by itself probably would have killed her. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, yeah, you just have to accept that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But um, out of 10, how much would you give it? I think I'm going to give it a seven and a half. Okay. It is, it is a basic movie done excellent, if that makes sense. Yes. He's a genre man. He took a right. basic genre thing following genre tropes and then right. turned it into something excellent. So, yeah. And also, you know, it's something that we didn't mention before, but casting choice of Uma Thurman. Uma Thurman was in Pulp Fiction and she didn't do any action in that movie. Yeah. But for her to be leading this movie, that was a stellar performance. That was a yeah. stellar performance. Yeah, but you see the performance. Of her, she had to learn how to fight. She had to learn Japanese to make it sound good. She had to do mm. things at the same time, and she pulled it off. Definitely, mm. a performance mm. that we. I, I genuinely, I genuinely believe that she should have been nominated for an Oscar. At least, um, this at time, least. for some reason, gets like before Brad Pitt finally won something that Tarantino did. I think because I think Brad Pitt won. An Oscar for his performance, I think. Samuel Jackson got a nomination, I think. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. For um, Django. But I think a lot of the, the stupid Hollywood committee don't, aren't. They're too snobbish, if that makes sense. Yeah. They're too yeah. snobbish. So they're, too, they're very hesitant on giving movies like Tarantino stuff the accolades it deserves. Because a lot of these actors are out here turning their A game. Even Nolan. Yeah. I mean, yes, Nolan has, I mean, okay, the stuff that he has done has won an award, but he hasn't won an award. But Heath Ledger would win something, uh, mm. you know. So you realize that there is a bit of bias there. I mean, I think yeah. someone, someone also asked why haven't Marvel superhero movies won anything like when you think about endgame or when you think about black panther um i'm not talking about maybe the movies themselves but whether it's the acting or the costume designing or okay okay i see what you mean okay i see what you mean yeah, I, I could be wrong but i think there are some multiple performances in oh, let's see what's a good example of a marvel movie with just a genuinely good performance um I did like Tony Stark's in um, Civil War. I thought Tony Stark did a great job. He did. So, he definitely did. it. He did. Uh, For me, personally, I would say 
the scene that that really really captivated me like I was mesmerized and which is something that I I'm, I'm, I'm hardly that mesmerized when I'm watching a Marvel movie but that scene the scene between Tony and and Peter when we see Peter for the first time whoa that exchange wait the funny one with the Jesus which Peter we're talking about uh Peter Parker oh oh okay yes yes absolutely yeah. uh, for me that was amazing way it's like uh, i don't know what you're talking about then he keeps um he's poking the ceiling and then <laughs> the suit falls off and they keep talking and it's like i need you to come with me i can't why can't you I have homework yeah. you know that whole exchange for me it was amazing yeah. because it was the first time i saw tom holland yeah. And I didn't know what to expect of him. But when I saw that acting, I was like, this kid has something. This kid yeah. is going to take him somewhere. That scene has to carry a lot of weight in a very small amount of time. Because Civil War is a busy movie. A lot of things, a lot of peer parts and even at the same time. So right. they gave that man like five minutes to design an entire Peter Parker personality. Like, And then I think the actors were at the top of their game. Mm. Really things together to make that emotionally um, build up. And... Right. We don't see that much of him until, and then, and, and then Infinity War, when I don't feel good, Mr. Parker. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't feel so good. Yeah. Mm, Mr. Stark, I, I don't feel so good. Yeah. 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 His performance there, and don't forget about the whole him getting mad at Captain America. That was my favorite. Yeah. Him getting mad at Captain America. You oh, said, yeah, if we fail, we'll fail together. You weren't there. You lied and just mm. and he collapses. Ah, oh. outstanding. That's what I mean by a scene getting the job done. Yeah. Like it's not good enough for you to be like, I can cry on cue. No, it's gotta get the done done. And that thing grabs you by the chest and hooked you. That's true. It's, that's yeah. Uh and you know, sometimes Tony is a hypocrite. Okay, I think we'll do a civil war thing. <laughs> Because for me, it's like you should have called Cap when you had the chance, but you didn't. But anyway, that's yeah. that's that's a conversation for another day. Um, yes. I think I would give it an eight out of ten. Um, it's a really good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it seems like it's written like an anime, and I'll tell you why. Um, some of the characters that are introduced, we get backstories of either during a fight or in between, like. Like just after a serious fight, mm -hmm. so that is anime. That is an anime um, template, right there. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. even how they introduce Gogo, you do get a bit of a backstory about her, even though it's very minimal. But it's like, wh why are you getting her backstory just before the fight? <laughs> That's so anime, you know. Yeah, so it's a, it's a for a stranger, yeah, definitely. Mm, mm, mm. So it was well done. It was yeah. well done. Yeah. That's um yeah of love of film but yes yeah mm -hmm. so yeah guys that is kill bill um the first one we're gonna be doing the second volume we won't be doing it next week i think we'll probably yeah. do it the week after but uh yeah let us know your thoughts did you like kill bill have you watched it and if you have is it something that you would still enjoy to this day is it, do you think that it still holds up after all this time, do you have a favorite moment? Do you have a favorite scene? Do you have a favorite quote? Who's your favorite character and why? And yeah, we'll definitely see you guys on the next episode. <laughs> yeah, 100%, man. All right. All right. Cheers. Always a pleasure.